Now we come to Sutta number 6.6.63. It's quite an important discourse. The Buddha said, uh, Monks, I will teach you a penetrative discourse, a Dhamma discourse. Listen, pay heed, I will speak. Yes, Lord, rejoined those monks. And the exalted one said, And what monks is this penetrative discourse, this Dhamma discourse? Monks, sense dark desires or sensual desires must be discerned, their source, variety, fruit, ending, and the steps leading there to monks, feelings, perceptions, asavas, kamma and dukkha must be discerned, their source, variety, fruit, ending, and the steps leading thereto must be discerned. Monks, it is said, sense desires, etc., must be discerned. And wherefore is this said? Monks, the strands or cords of sense desires are five. Forms cognizable by the eye, luring, longed for, loved, enticing, lustful, impassioning, Sounds cognizable by the ear, smells by the nose, taste by the tongue, touches by the body, luring, longed for, loved, enticing, lustful, impassioning. Though these are not sense desires, monks, in the Aryan discipline, they are called the strands or cords of the sense desires. And what is the source of sense desires? Contact, monks. And what is sense desire's variety? One sense desire is for forms, another for sounds, another for smells, another for taste, another for touch. This monks is called sense desire's variety. And what is sense desire's fruit? When desiring something, one engenders just that proper state of being to partake of merit or demerit. This monks is called sense desires fruit. And what is sense desires ending? Contact's ending is sense desires ending monks. And just in this Aryan Eightfold Path are the steps leading thereto, namely right view, right thoughts, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. And when the Aryan disciple thus knows sense desires, their source, variety, fruit, ending, and the steps leading thereto, he knows this penetrative holy life as sense desires ending. Monks, it is said, sense desires and so forth must be discerned. And because of this, it is said. I'll just stop here to comment a bit. Um... The strands or cords of sense desires, uh, it's called karma guna, uh, refers to the objects of the five senses, uh, forms, uh, sounds, smells, uh, taste and touch, uh, and, uh, and sensual pleasure is the pleasure that arises owing to these five strands or cords of sense desires. And the source of sense desires is contact, because from contact you get feeling arising. And, uh, okay, then the next one, uh, the Buddha continued. Monks, it is said, feelings must be discerned, etc. And wherefore, monks, feelings are these three, feelings of pleasure, sukha, feeling, feeling of pain, dukkha, and feeling of neither pleasure nor pain. And what is feeling source? Contact monks. And what is feelings variety? There are feelings of pleasure that are carnal. There are feelings of pleasure that are not. So too the feelings of pain and neither pain nor pleasure. This monks is called feelings variety. And what is feelings fruit? When feeling something, one engenders just that proper state of being to partake of merit or demerit. This monks is called feelings fruit. And what is feelings ending? Contacts ending monks. 
and just in this Aryan Eightfold Path are the steps leading to feelings ending, right view, etc. And when the Aryan disciple thus knows feelings, feeling source, etc., he knows this penetrative holy life as feelings ending. Monks, it is said, feelings must be discerned, and because of this it is said. Okay, I'll stop here again to comment a bit. Uh, uh, feelings variety, uh, there, are, there are feelings of pleasure and pain, uh, and neither pleasure or pain, that are carnal, that means bodily, and also uh, feelings of pleasure, pain, and neither pleasure nor pain, that are not carnal, that means mental feelings. In other suttas, uh, it is stated that uh, there are two types of feelings. One is bodily feelings and mental feelings. And in the Sangyutta Nikaya, it is said that bodily feelings arise from bodily contact and mental feelings are those that arise from mental contact, I mean from thinking. Yeah. And the Buddha continues, Monks, it is said, perceptions must be discerned, etc. And wherefore? Monks, perceptions are these six, perceptions of forms, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, and thoughts. And what is perception source? Contact monks. And what is perception's variety? There is one perception as to forms, another as to sounds, and so forth. This monks is called perception's variety. And what is perception's fruit? I say monks, perceptions are the result of habit. As one comes to know a thing, so one expresses oneself. Thus I perceived. This monks is called perception's fruit. And what is perception's ending? Contact's ending, monks. And just in this Aryan Eightfold Path are the steps leading to perception's ending, right view, etc. And when the Aryan disciple thus knows perceptions, etc., he knows this penetrative holy life as perception's ending. Monks, it is said, perceptions must be discerned, etc. And because of this, it is said. Stop here again. Eh? Perceptions are like a little like conceptions. Uh, perceptions refer to, for example, we see colors, we say this is yellow, this is brown, this is red, etc. Um, these are perceptions that we have in our mind. And other perceptions are like uh, we see uh, somebody and then we say that person is attractive or that person is uh, repulsive, etc., so this again is, is kind of your own opinion. That is why the Buddha said here that perceptions are the result of habit. Uh, for example, because of habit or because of uh, the way nature made uh, us. Uh, so a man may look at a woman as attractive and a woman may look as, at a man as attractive. But they are the result of habit and because they are the result of a habit, they can be changed. For example, if we practice the meditation on the 32 parts of the body, that's the practice of uh, loathsomeness of the body, yeah, then we are able to change our perception from attraction of a body to the loathsomeness uh, in, uh, in a body. Uh, so that is only possible because uh, perceptions are the result of habit. Uh, they are not uh, something that's absolute. Uh. Uh, that's the main thing here about perceptions. And then the Buddha continues, Monks, it is said, Asavas must be discerned, etc. And wherefore, Monks, Asavas are these three, Asava of lust, of becoming, of ignorance. And what is Asava's source? Ignorance, Monks. And what is Asava's variety? There are Asavas that lead to hell, to an animal's womb, to the realm of the ghosts, and to the world of man, and to the deva world. This monks is called asavas variety. And what is asavas fruit? When ignorant, one engenders just that proper state of being to partake of merit and demerit. This monks is called asavas fruit. And what is asavas ending? Ending of ignorance monks. And just in this Aryan Eightfold Path are the steps leading to the asavas ending, right view, etc. 
And when the Aryan disciple thus knows Asavas, etc., he knows this penetrative holy life as Asavas ending. Monks, it is said, Asavas must be discerned, etc., and because of this it is said. We stop here while to comment about Asavas. Asavas can be translated as uncontrolled mental outflows. Uh, uncontrolled mental outflows and uh, it refers uh, to uh, mainly to our defilements uh. here the asavas are given as three uh, asava of lust uh, of becoming or existence and of ignorance and uh, later in some suttas a fourth asava was added I think on views uh. so uh, now, asavas give rise to five places of rebirth, to hell, to animals, realm, to the ghost realm. These three are called the woeful planes, and then the human realm and the deva world. So there are five places of rebirth eh, for every being. And later books added a sixth, which is the asura realm. But uh, in the earliest discourses, asuras are considered as devas, heavenly beings. Eh? Now, to continue, the Buddha said, Monks, it is said, Kama or action must be discerned, etc. And wherefore, Monks, volition is Kama, I say. When one wills, one acts through body, speech or mind. And what is Kama's source? Contact Monks. And what is Kama's variety? There is Kama that is experienced in hell, in an animal's womb, in the ghost realm, in the human realm, in the deva world. This monks is called Kama's variety. And what is Kama's fruit? I say that it is threefold. It may either rise here now or at another time or on the way. This monks is called Kama's fruit. And what is Kama's ending? Contacts ending monks. And just in this Aryan Eightfold Path are the steps leading to actions ending, or karma's ending, right view, etc. And when the Aryan disciple thus knows karma, etc., he knows the penetrative holy life as karma's ending. Monks, it is said, karma must, must be discerned, etc. And because of this, it is said, stop here while to comment on karma. Karma here, the Buddha makes a very important statement. Volition. Is karma, I say, uh, in the Pali, it is Chetanahang Bikave Kamang Vadami. So, volition, the exercise of our will eh, or volition is karma. That means karma can be translated as intentional action, any action that is done with intention or purposely. Uh, and that is uh, karma, and then that can be done through the body, speech, or mind. Through the body, we do the karma of, for example, killing or stealing or committing adultery. Through speech, we can lie, we can uh, um, and, uh, create other verbal karma, and uh, through the mind, we can have intense hatred, uh, etc. And now karma, it is said, uh, may, there is the fruit of karma, which is the Pali word is vipaka. The result of karma is vipaka. Uh, is threefold. It may ripen here and now, or at another time, or on the way. In some other suttas, it is stated that all karma have the potential to ripen. But in some other sutta, it's also stated that not all karma will ripen. If all karma has to ripen, then uh, it will be quite impossible for us uh, to uh, get out of the cycle of existence. And because not all karma will ripen, that uh, it is possible for us uh, to get out of the round of rebirths. Now the Buddha continues, Monks, it is said, Dukkha or suffering must be discerned, its source, variety, fruit, ending, and the steps leading thereto. And wherefore is this said? Being born is Dukkha, aging is Dukkha, sickening is Dukkha, dying is Dukkha, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, despair are Dukkha. 
not to get one, what one wants is dukkha. In short, the five aggregates of clinging is dukkha. And what is dukkha's source? Craving monks. And what is dukkha's variety? Dukkha that is above measure. Dukkha that is trifling. Dukkha that is quick to change. And dukkha that is slow to change. <coughs> this monks is called dukkha's variety. And what is dukkha's fruit? Consider one overcome by dukkha, in mind for spent. <coughs> he grieves, mourns, laments, beats his breast, and becomes bewildered, or roams abroad in search of one who knows a spell or two to end his dukkha. Dukkha yields bewilderment and search, I say. This monks is called dukkha's fruit. And what is dukkha's ending? Cravings ending monks. And just in this Aryan Eightfold Path are the steps leading to Dukkha's ending, namely right view, right thoughts, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. And when the Aryan disciple thus knows Dukkha, its source, variety, fruit, ending and the steps leading thereto, then he knows this penetrative holy life as Dukkha's ending. Monks, it is said, Dukkha must be discerned, etc. And because of this, it is said, Verily, monks, such is this penetrative discourse, this Dhamma discourse, as the end of the Sutta. So the last part here is about Dukkha or suffering. Dukkha can be translated as suffering or sorrow or unsatisfactoriness, etc. Now, here Dukkha is generally defined as being born is Dukkha, aging is Dukkha, sickening, dying is Dukkha, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, despair. Uh, dukkha, not to get what one wants is Dukkha. In short, the five aggregates of clinging is Dukkha. The five aggregate of clinging uh, is basically body and mind. The mind part consists of four things, uh, feelings, perception, volition and consciousness. So these four things plus body makes up the five aggregates of clinging. These are the five things that we all cling to and which we all consider to be the self. Whenever you refer to yourself in the past life or in the future life or in the present life, you always refer to yourself in connection with these five things, eh? these five aggregates, body, feelings, perception, volition, consciousness, eh? uh, these five things. And uh, it is because of clinging to these five things eh, that uh, suffering arises. Eh? Now, there are some dukkha that is above measure, that is very extreme, very great. Then some dukkha that is trifling, some dukkha that is quick to change, and some dukkha that is slow to change. And then when one is overcome by dukkha, one grieves, mourns, laments, beats his breast and becomes wielded or roams about in search of one who knows a spell or two to end the dukkha. Dukkha yields bewilderment and search, I say. Now, this dukkha yields bewilderment and search. It is because of this result of dukkha that dukkha is a very good teacher. If not for dukkha, we would not want to walk this spiritual path. It is because as we go through life and we suffer, then uh, we get bewildered and then we search uh, for a way to end our dukkha. And if we are sincere enough, uh, we will come across the right dhamma. Uh, that will lead us out of suffering. Uh, so Dukkha is, a, is the best teacher in the world. If, you, if a person does, has not had enough of Dukkha, then uh, if you try to teach him the spiritual path, uh, he would not be interested. It is only at a certain time when a person is spiritually mature uh, through suffering, uh, then uh, that person is interested uh, to... Uh, cultivate the holy life uh, to end dukkha. Uh. 6.6.64 Monks, there are these six Tathagata powers of a Tathagata, possessed of which the Tathagata claims the place of the bull, 
roars the lion roar in assemblies and sets a rolling the Brahma wheel. What six? Herein monks, the Tathagata knows as it really is the possible as possible and the impossible as impossible. In that the Tathagata knows this, it is the Tathagata's Tathagata power, whereby the Tathagata claims the place of the bull, roars the lion roar in assemblies, and sets a rolling the Brahma wheel. Again, the Tathagata knows as it really is the result, with its possibilities and causes, of karmas undertaken in respect of the past, karma or action, eh? undertaken in respect of the past, present and future. In that he knows this, he sets a rolling the Brahma wheel. He knows the stain, purity and emergence in regard to the jhanas, liberations and concentrations and attainments. Remembers many a previous life, one birth, two, three, etc., so forth. He remembers each in all its modes and detail. With the purified Deva eye, surpassing the human eye, he sees the passing away and reappearance of beings, each according to his karma. Destroying the asavas, the Tathagata enters and abides in liberation by mind, in liberation by wisdom, asava free. In that the Tathagata so abides, it is the Tathagata's Tathagata power, whereby the Tathagata claims the place of the bull, roars the lion roar in assemblies, and sets a rolling the Brahma wheel. Monks, these are the six. And if monks, others come and question the Tathagata because of his knowledge, as it really is, of the possible as possible, according as the Tathagata's knowledge, as it really is, of the possible as possible, prevails. So the Tathagata explains to them by knowledge as it really is when questioned. And if others come and question him because of his knowledge, as it really is, of the result of karmas undertaken, the stain, purity and emergence in regard to jhana, etc., previous lives, the passing and reappearance of beings, or of asava destruction, according as his knowledge prevails, so he explains to them when questioned. Now this knowledge, as it really is, of the possible as possible, impossible as impossible, I declare it to be the, to be the possession of the concentrated, not of the unconcentrated. So too the knowledge, as it really is, of the other five. <clears throat> I declare them to be the possession of the concentrated, not of the unconcentrated. Thus verily, monks, concentration is the way, non-concentration the no-wither way. That's the end of the sutta. Here the Buddha is first talking about the powers of a Tathagata or a Buddha. A Tathagata means the thus gone one. This is, this is one of the ten names of the Buddha. And here there is given six powers of the Buddha. In some other suttas, uh, the ten, ten powers of the Tathagata are enumerated. And uh, the, the powers here is uh, he knows the possible as, in, as possible and the impossible as the impossible. And then he knows the possibilities, causes, etc. of the actions undertaken, uh, or karma undertaken. Then he knows the stain, purity and emergence in regard to the jhanas, liberations, concentrations and attainments. Then he remembers previous lives. Then he has the purified deva eye, uh, which can see the passing away and reappearance of beings. Uh. And then... Uh, the last one is he has destroyed the asavas eh, and attains liberation by mind and liberation by wisdom. Eh. So now the Buddha at the end eh, says that all oh, these higher knowledges attained eh, are because of concentration, eh, samadhi, and concentration or samadhi in the suttas is always defined as one pointedness of mind or the four jhanas. And um, now the jhanas are synonymous to satipatthana because satipatthana means intense states of mindfulness and we can see in the uh, Sanghita Nikaya when the Venerable Anuruddha was asked what is the cause of his uh, 
uh, great psychic power, and then he said it is satipatthana. But we know that uh, psychic power is always due to the jhanas. So this shows uh, that jhanas are synonymous with satipatthana. And also because it is stated uh, that um, the mark of uh, satipatthana is the mark of samadhi. Once a person has samadhi or the jhanas, uh, then uh, he automatically has the satipatthana. Uh, uh, that is why in the suttas the Buddha said that once you attain satipatthana, then you abandon the practice because you already uh, it's already automatic. Uh. The jhanas are also called the footsteps of the Buddha. And uh, and uh, here you can see uh, that the jhanas uh, are declared by the Buddha to be very important because the Buddha said concentration is the way. No concentration, the no way. Uh, in uh, Pali it is samadhi mago, a samadhi kumago. Samadhi is concentration, mago is the way. So a samadhi oh, is no concentration, is kumago. Kumago is a wrong way or here it is said to be no way. So samadhi is the way, no samadhi, no way. So it's very clear in the Buddha's teachings uh, that samadhi is very important. Um, there's no way, uh, no path uh, in the Buddha's teachings uh, without samadhi. And this also confirmed in the Anguttara Nikaya 4.170 where we heard earlier the Venerable Ananda said there's only four ways to attainment of arahanhood. The first one is samatha, first followed by vipassana. The second one is vipassana followed by samatha. The third is samatha and vipassana together. The fourth is meditation on the self until the mind becomes one-pointed and the way becomes clear. Now in one of the suttas in the Sangyutta Nikaya, the Buddha said uh, that the true Dhamma will vanish in the future because of no uh, respect, uh, no veneration uh, for the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, no veneration for the training and no veneration uh, or respect for Samadhi. Uh, so uh, if we don't, um, if we neglect Samadhi, uh, this will cause the uh, disappearance of the true Dhamma and here it is very clear that uh, the Buddha's way uh, is concentration. Samadhi mago, ah, samadhi kum mago. Now we come to the next sutta, 6.7.68. Verily monks, that a monk delighting in company, delighted by company, absorbed in the delights of company, delighting in gatherings, delighted by gatherings, absorbed in the delights of gatherings, shall find delight alone in seclusion, that cannot be, and that without finding delight in seclusion, he shall grasp the reflection of mind or the characteristic of mind, that cannot be, and that without so grasping, he shall become perfect in right view, that cannot be, and that without Becoming perfect in right view, he shall become perfect in right concentration, that cannot be. And that without becoming perfect in right concentration, he shall abandon the fetters, that cannot be. And that without abandoning the fetters, he shall realize Nibbana, that cannot be. That's the end of the sutta. So just now this sutta, uh, this sutta the Buddha is saying uh, that uh, seclusion, is uh, necessary eh? to finally attain nibbana. You must uh, you must have seclusion. Without seclusion, eh? you cannot grasp the reflection of mind or the characteristic of mind. Chitasa nimita, uh, and then without grasping the reflection of mind, eh? you shall attain uh, right view. Eh? That cannot be eh? without. Attaining right view, you shall attain right concentration that cannot be, and without right concentration, you shall abandon the fetters and realize Nibbana that cannot be. So, uh, seclusion is, a, is a, another one of the factors uh, that are very important in the holy life, uh, as taught by the Buddha. Uh, we find in many suttas, uh, the Buddha said uh, that certain monks lived alone, 
and then they strove very hard and attain arahanthood. Na. There's a well-known Indian saying that goes like this: the holy path is the path of the alone, to the alone, by the alone. Uh, this uh, path to uh, to nibbana, to get out of samsara, is, is to be attained one by one. Uh. And this sutta also uh, is quite clear uh, that right concentration uh, is very important uh, for Nibbana. Without right concentration, uh, the jhanas, uh, it is impossible to abandon the, fet- the fetters uh, and attain Nibbana. The next sutta is 6.7.69. Now when the night was well advanced, a deva shedding rays of far-reaching loveliness over Jeta Grove visited the exalted one, saluted and stood at one side. And so standing, he spoke thus to the exalted one, Lord, there are these six things that lead not to a monk's falling away. What six? Reverence for teacher, reverence for dhamma, reverence for the sangha, reverence for the training, meekness, and having good friends. Lord, these six things lead not to a monk's falling away. Thus spoke that deva, and the teacher approved. And the deva, perceiving that the master agreed, saluted and disappeared thence, keeping the exalted one on his right. Now at the, at the end of that night, the exalted one addressed the monks and told them all that had passed. And we, when, when he had spoken, the venerable Sariputta saluted the exalted one and said, Lord, the meaning of the exalted one's brief words I thus understand in full. Suppose, Lord, a monk himself reveres the teacher and praises such reverence. He will instill such reverence in others who lack it. And of those who possess it, he will speak in praise, justly, truly, and timely. So too of reverence for the Dhamma, reverence for the Sangha, reverence for the training, meekness, and having good friends. It is thus I understand in full the Exalted One's brief words. Well said, well said, Sariputta. It is just as you say. And Sariputta, thus the full meaning of my brief words ought to be understood. That's the end of the sutta. So in this sutta, uh, these six things are important uh, for a monk to have veneration for the teacher, the Buddha, veneration for Dhamma, and veneration for the Sangha, veneration for the training. The monk's training uh, includes the precepts and other things uh, that a monk must learn. And uh, meekness, meekness is a uh, uh, quality uh, a monk should uh, possess, uh, not to be aggressive, uh, to be meek and gentle. And having good friends, having good friends, friends, good friends are those uh, who are knowledgeable uh, in the Dhamma or interested in the Dhamma and uh, who practice the holy life. Uh, because uh, as we practice the holy life with good friends, uh, we support each other, encourage each other, and uh, that is important uh, because there are times when a person may get discouraged, uh, especially a person who is new on the holy path. Uh. Okay, the next sutta, 6.7.70, the Buddha said, Verily, monks, that a monk without the peace of concentration in high degree, without attaining to calm, without winning one-pointedness, shall have part in the many psychic powers, Being one, he becomes many. Being many, he becomes one. He reaches in body even as far as the Brahma world. That cannot be. Shall hear with the purified Deva ear, surpassing man's sounds of Devas and men, far and near. That cannot be. Shall know by mind, compassing mind, the thoughts of other folk, other persons, the passionate as such, the unemancipated as such. That cannot be. Shall call to mind many a previous life, one birth, two births, etc. That cannot be. Shall see with the Deva eye the faring of men. That cannot be. Shall enter and abide in liberation by mind, liberation by wisdom, asava. That cannot be. That's the end of the sutta. Here the Buddha is saying, uh, without the peace of concentration in high degree, without attaining to calm, without winning one-pointedness, a person cannot have the various psychic powers uh, 
and cannot attain liberation by mind and liberation by wisdom, asava free. So, uh, here again, uh, we find uh, the importance of samadhi or the jhanas being stressed. Jhanas are necessary for psychic power. And um, that's why just now I mentioned, uh, Venerable Anuruddha said uh, that the cause of his psychic power is Satipatthana, which just shows uh, that Satipatthana is synonymous uh, with jhanas. Um, in uh, Anguttara Nikaya, uh, one of the suttas we have read earlier, it is stated uh, that uh, Sotapanna and Sakadagamin have perfect sila and Anagamin have perfect sila and samadhi, and an Arahan has perfect sila, samadhi and panya. So all Anagamis, the third fruition, Arya, and Arahans, the fourth fruition, uh, Arya, must possess perfect samadhi, perfect concentration, that means the jhanas. Uh, this is another sutta, this, uh, uh, which, from which it is quite clear that jhanas are necessary. Yeah? Now the next sutta is 6.8.78. Monks, if a monk follow six things, he will live here and now in great happiness and contentment. And for him the mole has begun to form for destroying the asavas. What six? Herein a monk delights in Dhamma, in development, bhavana, in renunciation or abandoning, in total seclusion, in being free of ill will, and in non-proliferation of thoughts. Nipa pancha. Monks, if a, follow, if a monk follow these six things, he will live in great happiness here and now and contentment. And for him the mole has begun to form for destroying the asavas. It's the end of the sutta. Destroying the asavas means becoming an arahant. Huh? And uh, these six things uh, are important. Uh, he delights in Dhamma. That means he loves the Dhamma, loves to uh, study or listen to Dhamma and discuss Dhamma. In development, bhavana. Development means development of the mind. Bhavana, uh, and that means uh, um, uh, practicing meditation and uh, especially uh, attaining samadhi. Because when a t person attains samadhi, the hindrances are abandoned. Eh? Third one is renunciation, eh? abandoning, letting go. Fourth one is total seclusion, paviveka, total seclusion or aloofness, eh? being aloof from others. Eh? Uh, yeah. And then being free of ill will, eh? not to have anger. And the last one is non-proliferation non of thoughts, nipapancha. For most people, eh, there is always a proliferation of thoughts. One thought becomes ten, ten becomes a hundred, etc. And non-proliferation of thoughts eh, can be attained eh, when we attain one-pointedness of mind, when we attain the jhanas, eh, then we experience a bliss, a happiness, eh, free of thinking. And that happiness which is free of thinking surpasses the happiness eh, of thinking. It is only through that eh, that we can renounce thinking. Eh.